praise you, my Savior, all the day long, and we are here to praise God. David said, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. we got to work on that this summer, right? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen. It's great to see Millie Stanley with us. We celebrate her birthday later, and just a crack, congratulations. And we welcome our guests. We welcome people who are watching online as we come into God's house to worship him. We'll begin this morning. We'll stand as we get ready to sing. If the singers will come. <laughs>
Now it is? Can you hear me? Okay. You guys don't really need to hear me anyway. These guys just need to hear me. That's okay. Well, good morning. What a great group we've got here. All right. Well, I'm going to try and build a bridge this morning. You guys know what a bridge is, right? Yep. What is it? Cars can go on. Yep. Sometimes there's just pedestrian bridges, which is people walk on. Connects one side of something to the other side. Okay, so I've got... We're going to pretend these are my, like, my cliffs or something. Okay, I'm going to try and build a bridge across here. All right, here we go. I don't know. What do you think of my bridge so far? Looks okay, huh? What's the important thing about a bridge? It's got to hold something up, right? Okay, here we go. Think it's going to hold? Does anybody think it's going to hold my bridge? You don't think it's going to hold this? If I just set it, okay, if I just set it. Oh, you guys were right. It doesn't hold. Well, tell you what. I'm going to use part of my bridge here. I'm going to use the same piece of paper that I tried to make my bridge with. I'm going to have to set my microphone down. All right, same piece of paper. We tried it once, didn't work so well. Let's try it again. The only thing different is I shake, whoops, my whole bridge fell apart. That's not gonna work. Thank you. <laughs> there you go, we had a little earthquake, like a 4.0 or something, okay. So now, same piece of paper that didn't work. I, I folded it, I shaped it, I molded it a little bit differently. Now, what do you think? Who thinks that's gonna work? Some people think it's going to work. If I set it real gently. Wow, there you go. It yes, it worked. It held up the glass, didn't it? So I took the same piece of paper that didn't work and I folded it differently. I shaped it, I molded it. It's kind of like what God can do with us. If we let him into our heart, if we invite him into our heart, he can shape us and mold us to be the people he wants us to be. And by his spirit, we can do and think and, and act and talk the way he wants us to do, okay? So just because this didn't work the first time, it's more useful now, isn't it? It wasn't very useful for a bridge the first time, but it's useful. So God can shape us too and make us into the people he wants us to be, okay? So let's, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for all these children here today. Thank you for the beautiful, sunshiny day that you've given to us. I ask by your spirit that your, your Holy Spirit would be in these children and, that, and teach them to think and to do and to say and to act the way to be your people that bring glory to you. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It's a beautiful spring day, isn't it? Well, I was looking through the bulletin here because I know that we have Millie Wenzel's birthday that we're celebrating. Do you guys realize how many birthdays and anniversaries you have in your church? I counted 10 birthdays and anniversaries in the first nine days of May. So I think when you shake someone's hand, you can just about say happy birthday and you <laughs> probably get it. So, uh, we're going to take a minute here for morning prayer. So I just want to open it up if there are any prayer requests that we can pray about this morning. You'll let me know. For Dustin. Yep, there's a... Hattie's uncle is recovering from surgery. Yes, Tate. Nathan McVeigh has a kidney illness, and I believe will need kidney transplants. I'm not mistaken. Okay. Okay. All right. Anybody else? All right, well, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer then. Father God, we love you and adore you. We, we thank you so much that we can come together as, as a church family, Lord, and, and, uh, just, and be in your presence, be in fellowship with one another, Lord. Open your word and study it, Lord. I thank you for that. I thank you for the wonderful day that you've created. And Lord, these requests, we just lift them up to you, Father. We pray for Dustin, that you would continue his recovery from his heart surgery, Lord, that he would walk in health in that. And for Nathan McVeigh, Lord, we pray for healing in his body, Lord, specifically with the kidneys. God, I pray that there would just be a victory, a praise report there, that the glory would go to you for healing in that situation, Father. Lord, I just, I pray for each family that's here. Lord, I know every family is going through different things. Some are probably on mountaintops and others might be going through valleys this morning, Lord. But here we are all together and we know that, that you love us and care for us and, and you know intimately all those little things that are going on. So Father, I just pray that you move mightily on behalf of the families here in this church, Lord. And uh, Father, for this morning, for this word, I just pray that you would... Your anointing would accompany this message, Lord, that you would open our hearts to receive, Lord, as, as we look at your word, that you would minister to us specifically, Father, that it would be more than words on a page, but that it would be uh, ideas that would shape our life, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, our scripture reference for today is in 1 John 5. And it's 9 through 12. I, I, I had it uh, recorded in the bulletin wrong, so that is my mistake. It's actually 9 through 12. And it reads, We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it, because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe, God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So as you probably guessed from that scripture reference there, uh, we're dealing with our testimony today. In verses 11 and 12 there, the last part of that is really the theme, uh, the main point of today's message uh, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So, I mean, that's, that's the point. That, that's, that's what we're here. That, that's why we're walking around on this planet, to be able to share with, with others what God has done in our life. And our testimony should be that we have eternal life, because of Jesus, the Son of God. And how many of you know that the world looks a little bleak? And I'm sure every generation has said that. It's okay, you can raise your hands. <laughs> it does. But it does seem like things are growing more and more toward instability. And, and uh, in the midst of all that, we can have hope. Because we can have a reference point knowing where our future is going to land, 
what eternity is going to be like. And we also know that God has recorded in the book what it's going to be like in the end. So when we th- see things and we look around and we say, well, it looks like everything's falling apart, uh, there's, a, there's an expression that says it's not falling apart, it's just falling all into place. And that's a little bit of what we're witnessing. So given that, we have a big job to do because we're the ones who have the hope of, of a future. We have the rescue plan for those who, who don't know what tomorrow is going to bring or, or if this world is going to be around in the next 100 years or the next 10 years, sometimes it looks like. But we have those answers for them. And uh, some of you may know, I, I'm a facilitator for uh, Instay Global Bible College. And part, part of that is the, the first class that we we teach, or the first course is Discipleship One. And I, what I love about this is it's all designed for equipping and training um, brothers and sisters in Christ for the work of ministry, because every single one of us has a ministry to do. And so it teaches us, first off, the first course is how to be a disciple of Christ. And about nine weeks into the course, it's, it's testimony night. And so uh, it's, it's, it's the highlight of the course for me. I, I, love, I love week nine where the students sit down and they have to think about their testimony. And so they write out their testimony. A lot of times, most of them, I would say, probably have never shared their testimony before, let alone written it out. And so it's, it's, it's a really neat, it's a really powerful night. It's a really emotional night. When everyone sits down and they share, they share what they were like before, how they met Jesus, and what their life is like afterwards. And um, it's just great to hear those stories, how Jesus transforms lives. And so that's what we're going to deal with today a little bit. Last week we dealt with the parable of the rich man and Lazarus the beggar. And at the end of last week's message, we came to the point that if the lost who have died could come back, they would preach the gospel. And and we pull that from Jesus' parable of the rich man as he pleads with Abraham to send Lazarus, the beggar, back to his family because he has five brothers and, and, and they need to hear the truth. They need to repent. If only they could have Lazarus return, then they would see the error in their ways, they would repent and they would they would turn to God. And so we closed the service last week with with a call for everybody to think about, does my father's house need the truth? Do I have five brothers? And it doesn't have to be limited to your family, but but are there family members? Do you have friends? Do you have neighbors that, that don't know the good news? They don't know about Jesus. They haven't surrendered their life to him. And it was a call to, to go out and, and, and reach them. So I thought it'd be fitting this week to follow up with our testimony. So how many of you are familiar with the Great Commission? See some hands. Yes, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19. says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and, the Ho- and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. So as we look at this, I have two things initially pop out in my mind as as I read that passage, as we look at the Great Commission. One is, he says, uh, go and baptize. So we get the idea of them coming into the body of Christ, being baptized into the body of Christ, basically. Um, Now, and it's a call for physical baptism, but... So, so there's an element of making converts, and I, and I don't like to use that word because to me, this is my definition, the convert is someone who believes and then doesn't do anything else. It's like I switched religions and I'm a convert. And, and the Great Commission doesn't stop there. It doesn't say, go into all the world and make as many converts as possible. There's the, there's the other part. It's to make disciples, and it talks about teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. So it's more than converting people to your form of Christianity. It's teaching them about the word of God and showing them a relationship with the creator that they can walk in day after day. So I think there's a difference between converts and disciples. 
The second part is that it takes disciples to make disciples. So when Jesus said to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, they knew fully what that meant. Because they had just gone through about three, three and a half years of a master's program in discipleship underneath Jesus. They got to walk with him and hear about um, how he taught. They got to see how he prayed. They got to understand what kind of character he had. And so when we look at discipleship, there's three, three, three points here, and I'm not going to spend much time on these. But just to say that, number one, it takes relationships to make disciples. Uh, Mark 3.14 says, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So that's that closeness that they had. They got to sit under his teaching. They got to see his compassion, his love, his submission to the will of God. They learned from him. And so out of that close relationship, they get to understand what it's like to mirror the one that's discipling them. Okay? The second thing then is discipleship requires instruction. So not only is it relational, but there's instruction that's involved. And, and we have to know the word of God to understand the Great Commission was teach them, teach them all that I have commanded so that they would obey it, basically. In order to do that, we've got to know what's in here. We've got to know what God said. So there's an element of instruction that, that comes along with that. And um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So teaching, rebuking, correcting, um, it all requires application. It's more than head knowledge. It has to be uh, something that, that we walk out. So the Bible is like the instruction manual for the disciple of Christ. And uh, as we disciple others, we share and teach them the word of God. And then the third part, so we have relationship, we have instruction. The third part of, of being a disciple is total commitment. And this, I think, gets overlooked a lot. But uh, Luke 14, 26 says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. He's using a hyperbole here for, to create a vivid image. He's saying that in comparison, God needs to be first. A disciple should be so devoted in Christ that, that by comparison, everything else in their, look, in their life looks like it's hated by them. And... Uh, he goes on, he talks about that, that whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And then in verse 28, he talks about how we have to sit down and weigh out the cost. He uses the example of a tower. Do you have enough money to complete that? Um, or a king going to war? Do you have enough men to, to, to conquer the, the oncoming enemy? And then in verse 33, it says, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. And so it's talking about a disciple would understand the cost. It's total loyalty to Christ. And for a long time, there's been a, a gospel preached that basically says, if you receive Jesus, everything in your life will just go great. Everything will be straightened out and fixed. And that's, there's tons of benefits for following Christ in this life. But it doesn't mean that you're going to be, you're escaping from all forms of, of trial or trouble that may come. In fact, Jesus taught the exact opposite. But in the midst of that, he tells us that we can have peace with him, even though life is, is, is falling apart around us, possibly. So a disciple is totally committed. They're totally loyal to Christ. They must die to themselves, yield all that they have to God fully submitted to God, which is what total commitment is all about for the disciple. So those three requirements of discipleship, relationship with the master, instruction in the word of God, and total commitment to follow Christ. Now the great thing about all this is that in God's plan to reach mankind in salvation, we get to be a part of that. And that's why we're commissioned to go out and make disciples. 
Uh, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit by Acts 1.8. We are called co-laborers in God's field for his purpose in 1 Corinthians 3.9. And how many of you know that God's plan to reach the world is the church? How many of you are the church? A few of you, about half of you are the church. So we got half the church here. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. We're the church. We're God's plan. We're his number one. Uh, as my pastor says, this is the A plan, the church, to reach the world. So we have an obligation. We get to be co-laborers with him. And so when we talk about our testimony, our testimony can be a very powerful tool to share Christ with other people. But a lot of times, we don't think about our testimony as relevant, or we don't think about our testimony uh, in terms of how do we even present that to somebody. So today, that's my focus. This is going to be a little more teachy-oriented, um, but I, I want to give you a, a framework, and it's a really simple framework for sharing your testimony. Here's the framework. Three parts. You can all remember three parts. First, explain what you were like before you met Christ, okay? Before. Second part, relate how you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior of your life. So how, how, how did that conversion experience look like? And then, anybody want to guess what the third part is? Shout it out. What it was like before, how, how I met Jesus, life after. Yes. What's your, what is your life like now, now that you're following Jesus? So last week... We use the story of the blind man found in John 9 to make some points in that sermon. And today, I'm going to use that same story to help us remember the three points of our testimony. And truly, I just really enjoy this story because there are so many parts in the Bible that as you're reading it, I think like I can't preach that any better than how God wrote it down because it just, it just captures your attention and, and parts of it are just hilarious. So uh, starting in verse... Uh, John 9, verses 1 through 5. Uh, he says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus' answer was, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So you get the idea. They came across a blind man. The disciples want to understand why this happened, and we talked about this last week, about the, the, the present condition that he was in. But Jesus corrects their way of looking at it, and he says, no, you know what, this guy is blind right now because I'm going to do a work in his life. So one, we get to see the power of God in a miracle that this guy is going to be healed. But number two, I think this guy was born blind so that he would see Jesus, so that God just knew. He's like, you know what, that guy, if, he, if he's blind, he's going to come to faith. And, and Jesus made sure that that, that, that path was, was crossed with him about that. So Jesus says in verse 4, As long as, as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And notice how Jesus said, we must do the works of him who sent me. It wasn't that Jesus had to do it. But there's a call for all of us to be doing those works. And we have a limited window of time in which we can do that, right? How many of you know that you live for a while and then you die? Okay. So during that time period, that's when we work. Because when it's night, you're done. It's over. You can't, you can't work anymore here. So our testimony is a big part of that labor. Okay, let's go to verse 6 then. John 9, starting in verse 6. After saying this, this is Jesus, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am that man. I'm the guy. Yeah, this is me. So this guy meets Jesus. Jesus puts mud in his eyes and sends him to the pool of Siloam to wash. And he's miraculously healed. And people can't believe it's the same guy. 
I'm just saying, people may not believe that you're the same person if your conversion is that drastic. That's pretty awesome, really. So they doubted, right? And then, then of course, here comes the controversy. This is where the story, like, gets even better than a, a, a man being healed uh, from his blindness. Uh, verse 10, they ask, how then were your eyes opened? Okay, if you're really that guy, how do you now see? He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Do you know how ridiculous that had to have sounded to those people? Okay, you're the blind guy. How? How can you now see? Well, this fellow named Jesus smeared some mud on my face, and I washed it off, and now I can see. Seems pretty dumb, doesn't it? Not dumb, but ridiculous. Like, there's, logically, that doesn't work. Guess what? When Jesus saves you and your life changes, people might look at you like, "Uh uh-huh, right. That doesn't make sense. Really? You believe that? You believe that you can talk to God and say, Lord, I, I repent. I'm sorry. Please forgive me and come into my life. And that changes you? Are you serious? It's the same thing. This guy, he's dealing with mud. And uh, so then they ask, where is this guy? Where is this man? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> so they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And the man answers, he put mud in my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. I wonder if at this point as they're like trucking him along to the priest, if he's thinking like, am I in trouble? Like did I do something wrong? And so they take him in there and the priest questioned him and same thing. How how is it that you see? Well, I met this guy named Jesus, put mud in my eyes, I went and washed, and and, and now I can see. And I mean, right there, you have the picture of the before. So before he was blind and dirty, and then he goes to the pool, and he washes himself like repentance, and then he comes out of the pool, he's clean, and now he can see. There's a kind of a little metaphor going on there. And uh, so, I'm guessing it was a pretty big deal <laughs> for everyone there as he's before the Pharisees. The problem is that not everyone liked the answer. And I'm guessing when you share your testimony, not everyone is going to like the answer that you're giving as to why you're different. They would much rather hear you say, well, I went through the 12 steps of transformation, and if you follow these, then you're just, your life is different. You get renewed. A lot of people don't want to hear the God thing. They don't want to hear about Jesus because they're closed off to that. But this guy, he gave them the true answer. So then in John 9, starting in verse 16... Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, he is a prophet. So obviously the religious people didn't like the answers. They didn't like Jesus. They're trying to draw conclusions over what took place, and they're split over it. And so the debate heats up. So now it goes to the point where they got to call his parents in. Because they're like, we just don't believe you at all. You're a fake. And so they call his parents in. They question his parents. Like, was he really born blind? And they're like, yeah, he was. And how did did he get his sight back? Well, you got to ask him about that. We know he was born blind. And now that he sees, but you got to ask him, because they didn't want to get kicked out of the church. They knew that if they said Jesus healed him, they were, they were going to kick him out of the church. I had to tell you, if you go to a church where your testimony and get you kicked out of church, it's probably not a good church. Go to a different church. And, and I know we don't have to worry about that here. <laughs> but sometimes the change is so drastic that people just refuse to believe it and they can't recognize it. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Jim I used to work with in a factory. This guy was 
he was, he was a big guy. He had arms probably like that. He was huge. And he had this, like it wasn't actually tattooed on his forehead, but it just said, leave me alone, don't talk to me. And, and I was his boss. And that's the way it was like when I talked to him. Like he could barely say a word. Nobody wanted to be around him. Everyone was scared of him. And uh, he just acted like, I don't care about anyone and leave me alone. And he looked like he hated life in this world. So it was clear. He didn't have any friends and he didn't want any friends. So I moved on from that job. And a couple years later, I was walking through like a Walmart or a Kmart or something, all right? And I look down the aisle and I see, I see Jim down the aisle. And he had, he had a smile on his face. Like I had to like double take. I was like, I've never seen that guy smile ever. I've never even seen him look happy once. Hey, Jim, you get a raise. Great. You know, and so... I was a little bit drawn to it. So I walked by him and I said, hey, and he turns around and he sees me, hey. He says, hey, you know what? Right off the bat, he says, I just, I want to apologize first off. He said, my attitude was so terrible when I used to work for you and uh, my life is just different now. I found Jesus, I'm following him and and everything has changed. And I'm just, I I might like pick my jaw up off the ground. I was like, yeah, it has. Like I can tell, (laughs) that's amazing. That's, now, that's a transformation that was visible. And, and, and so I knew what he was like before. He didn't have to explain much about that. But it was a 180-degree turn, I could tell. And now I see him encouraging people, praying for people on social media, stuff that I would never have guessed this guy would ever do, ever. But God changed him. So back to the blind man. Uh, let's see, John 9, 24. We'll go there. So they've talked to his parents. Now a second time they summon the man who had been blind. And they tell him, give glory to God by telling the truth. And actually that translation is not the greatest. Basically they were saying, give glory and praise for your sight to God. Forget about the Jesus part. That's really. So they say, uh, give glory to God by telling the truth. They said, we know this man is a sinner. So they're telling him, reject Jesus. Go ahead and give glory to God for what happened, but let's leave the Jesus part out of this, okay? How many of you know that's what happens in this world? There's so many people that are okay with God, like the idea of God. Yeah, do you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. But you talk about Jesus, well, that's, I don't know. Really? I don't really ascribe to all that stuff, but I do believe there's a God. Same thing. These guys are like, you know what? Give glory to God. Forget about that guy, Jesus. Uh, because you know what? We, we know that he is a sinner. But this guy stood his ground. And he replies, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And isn't that the declaration? I was blind, but now I see. I don't care what you guys think of Jesus. This is what I know about him. He healed me. He changed me. I was blind, but now I see. So don't leave Jesus out of your testimony. Now the rest of this, as we read through this, I frankly just find this hilarious, okay? So here we go. Verse 26. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? This is the third time he's been asked this question, right? He answered, and I think he's getting irritated just a little bit. He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? That's probably fighting words for those guys, okay? Like at this point, he doesn't care. He's getting kicked out of church, okay? So um, then, verse 28, they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And then the man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man was not from God, he could do nothing. I think he just got like, that's like the power to share your testimony right there. 
He's in the face of rejection, and he's like, really? You don't know where he came from. You guys are the religious people? Let me give you a little lesson on religion. (laughs) And to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. So what a story. This guy nails him. And they kick him out of church, and he's probably like, yeah, you know what? That's fine. I don't like this church anyway. (laughs) They were denying the power of God, and, and the proof was standing right in front of him. They just couldn't receive it. And so not everyone is going to be fond of your testimony. You might get ridiculed. You, your testimony might re- be rejected. And it's okay. That's part of it. Your job is to share. When God opens the door, you share. You let him do the rest. If you're ridiculed or rejected, you walk down the road. Or you pray for another opening. And if it's received, then glory to God. So then in in, uh, John 9, 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. This guy got more than a physical healing of his sight. He got spiritually healed in in that that day. Um, His spiritual blindness was taken care of as well. He He became a believer in the Son of God, a believer in Jesus. And the remaining parts of that chapter we dealt with last week, so I'm not going to go through that right now. But uh, I do want to finish up by just talking about briefly our testimony. Um, I was blind, I met Jesus, and now I see. We can remember that. And that's that's the elements of your testimony that you can share too. All testimonies have those three components, yet they all are different. They have different details about it. And it's that uniqueness in your testimony that is going to be what allows you to be relatable to the person that you're talking with. God's equipped you for the mission field in front of you. And your testimony can relate to those who do it. My testimony may not be what some people need to hear. But my friend, my friend Ryan... I know his testimony speaks directly to some people. And God tends to just bring those people across our paths so that they can hear and and they can receive. So there's a few things I just want to touch on that I've, from teaching the class, that I've learned that we need to keep in mind as we share our testimony. One is be relatable to that person. If you can find some common ground to connect how your testimony relates to them, Minister to them. When, what you went through, what your test was, can be redemption for them. They can, they can understand that you walked through it and you came out okay, and this is how. It was by Jesus. Second is um, keep it short. Don't get overly detailed. Okay? You can talk about the weather. You can talk about dates and names. Unless it's pertinent to that story, most people don't care. But, but they do want to know what you were like before how you met Jesus, and what life was like afterwards. And, and keep it balanced. A lot of times, as we share testimonies in the classroom setting, it goes like this. You have six minutes to deliver your testimony. They spend the first five telling us how terrible they were. And then it, it, then it is, uh, and then I met Jesus and my life got better. That was it. So we work on balance, okay? Tell them what your life was like, but really think about how your life has gotten better. That's a big deal. Share that part. That's what people want to know about. They don't, they, like we know everyone's bad and, and sinners, but tell me what Jesus did for you, how it's better. And then the other thing is, is your point of conversion. And this takes, this takes a minute to think through sometimes, especially for those who grew up in church and they feel like, well, I don't really know. I, I was just in church my whole life and I just followed God. There's got to be a point in your life and it might take a little bit of reflection to think back to was there a point of like spiritual crisis or maybe a real crisis where you grabbed a hold of that faith and made it your own? And I, so if you can reflect back and think about that event, that's what you need to tell people about. That, that's, that's what gives credit to Jesus rather than, I mean, some people, it's like, well, I started going to church here and... And then my life got better, and now I'm, I'm, I'm following Jesus. OK, 
okay, that's good, but there's got to be a point in your personal relationship with the Lord that there's something changed. You committed to follow him, and he did a renewing process inside of you. You changed. And so think that through. What was that? What was that? Um, and finally, we do tend to focus on the external things, whereas the internal things are probably more important and more relatable to people. Um, so, for example, say, like, this isn't me. I have enough things I did wrong. I don't need to add this to my list. But say I stole cars. And I'm like, I used to steal cars. And I met Jesus, and now I don't steal cars. Like, okay, that's great to know. That's the external. But I want to know what happened on the inside. And so if you can focus on that, if, if I could assign homework this week, it would be for you to sit down, think about this, write your testimony out, what you were like before, how you met Jesus, and what you're like after. And focus on the stuff that was going on inside of you, not so much the external things. Because the car thief may not be able to relate to the drug addict in the external things. But I can just about guarantee you that on the internal things, the reasons why they were both seeking to do something may have been an emptiness, a void. It might have been pain. Those are the things that we can focus on that relates to more generally to everyone. So, and I know we need to close it up here because I'm getting a little bit long. But uh, do you want to hear my testimony? If you don't, that's fine. I won't share it. <laughs> okay. All right. Here's an example, okay? Life before. There was a period of time in my life when I was not following Jesus. I made some really, really bad choices. My life was a mess. I was consumed by a sinful lifestyle, led to adultery and divorce. I wrecked my family. I felt utterly hopeless. I was filled every day with shame and guilt. It was overwhelming. I was disgusted with myself, yet I had no power to change who I was. And I was in constant turmoil and conflict inside. I felt lonely and I felt like a total failure. And I felt worthless. And I had no security of where I would be if I died or when I died. That was my life before. It all changed when I opened my Bible and I knew I needed to start following the Lord. But I just, I, I couldn't make that step. And so I was reading in Proverbs. It seemed like the only part of the Bible that I could even read was just the Proverbs. And I was reading in the Proverbs, and it was dealing with the wicked and the righteous. And I was reading it with, like, Christian glasses on. Like, I grew up in church, you know. And so as I'm reading through that, I'm like, yeah, I'm righteous. And, uh, and then those wicked people, you know. And I just felt in that moment, like, the presence of the Holy Spirit pressed upon me and clearly said, you are counted with the wicked. It just broke me. So I repented. I gave that to the Lord. I asked for forgiveness. I promised to change my life with his power, with his help. And I made some really hard decisions. And I'd love to tell you that the next day, all those feelings went away, but they didn't. In fact, the loneliness got worse because not only had I burned so many bridges before, but now I made some more hard choices and I was burning every other bridge that I had. I felt like I had nobody, it seemed like. Like I made everybody mad. But the feeling inside got better. And, and I would say that... Uh, it took me about six months to really understand what it meant to be forgiven and to really believe that I could be forgiven and that I was indeed forgiven. So faith is believing in God and that what he says is true. And so when I could actually receive his grace by faith, by believing that, that that's what he had for me, everything changed. It's that point of really knowing and really applying the faith that I had learned about when I was a kid, and walked in for a while. And so then after that, how is life now? I'll tell you what, a giant weight has been lifted from my shoulders. Once there was shame and guilt, now I have peace and I have security. 
I have a, a fulfilling sense of purpose in my life because God has given me a job to do and he's generously given me talents and abilities to accomplish that work. There's no more loneliness in my life, but rather I feel like I'm sharing every minute with the Lord because I'm walking with him. I have fellowship with him continually. I'm free from the bondage of sin. My mind is free. My conscience is clean. I have value. I have hope. And I know that I have a future. And I have joy all the time, even when things in life aren't going so well. I still have that joy. And that's because of the Lord. We all have a testimony that's like that. And if, if, we, if we can think that through and focus on those type of things, that's what people want to hear. They need to understand the internal struggle. That's how we're salt and light in this world. The salt's no good if you leave it in the shaker, right? Pass the salt, thanks. But you got to put it on the food. If I give my kid a flashlight and he runs around the house in the middle of the day, do you know what happens? The batteries go dead. It didn't benefit anybody. But if you use that light it, when it's dark... Now it's a benefit, and that's what the Bible talks about. You don't take a light and hide it under a bowl. It's the same thing. You use it where it needs to be. We're salt and light. So we need to be laborers. We need to be working for the, for the harvest. And I would say make sure we're prayerful about it. For those people last week that you identified that need to be reached, pray for them. Commit to pray for them. Ask God for the opportunities to open those doors so that you can share and, and simply start the conversation. You don't have to go in it saying, I'm going to share my testimony. But you can start the conversation, ask them how things are going. And then we'll just see what doors God opens up for you. So with that, I have a, one last quote to give you here. We're supposed to go and do what Jesus commissioned us to do. And this is from Billy Graham. Graham. He said, the evangelistic harvest is always urgent. The destiny, the destiny of men and of nations is always being decided. Every generation is strategic. We are not responsible for the past generation, and we cannot bear the full responsibility for the next one. But we do have our generation. God will hold us responsible as to how well we fulfill our responsibilities to this age and take advantage of our opportunities. Billy Graham. All right, let's pray. Father God, I just thank you that, that you love us and you redeemed us. Lord, I thank you for the testimony that we have as sons and daughters of yours, Lord. I pray for those who are lost, Lord, that you would bring them across our paths, that you'd give us the words to say, Lord, that you'd prepare their hearts to receive from us, and that you'd just help us to know how to share with them the hope that we have inside of us, Lord. I thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Well, if you all stand, we are going to sing hymn 506.
Okay, you may be seated. I have the deacons come forward for the offering. Father God, I thank you that we have this opportunity to give back to you what you've given to us, Lord. We, we owe everything to you, Lord. And this is just a, a form of thanksgiving to give back to you. Lord, we, I pray that you bless those who are giving, Lord, and that you would bless the gift to, to go on to multiply um, what you have set forth for it to do. In Jesus' name, amen. second time through, as we started, we're singing God's blessings to you. So, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.
Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say the benediction. So the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.